So this year, we look to the future, whether in terms of art practice or new narratives, or indeed challenging old narratives, whether in the realms of politics, gender, or both, hence the theatre of change. A lot has happened since the Theatre of War Symposium of last year. Some of these issues, again, will be discussed this year. And what has emerged over the last three symposia is the story around the role of artists and their activism in, the in times of conflict and resistance and change. We had many examples of this, and it is something we will hear again uh, over the next three days. So it is a culmination of conversations and discourses that started on this stage at the Theatre of Memory Symposium in January 2014, when President Michael D. Higgins called for making something new and reworking old myths. Our symposium concludes on this very stage on Saturday morning with the world premiere of Twinsome Minds by our friend and previous symposium co contributor, Richard Kearney, who will be joined by Sheila Gallagher in an illustrated performance lecture responding to that presidential challenge, how to engage with 1916, commemoration, memory, and trauma, and doing that by reworking new myths, new ideas with old Irish myths. This year, too, we saw important events happening on the Abbey stage, such as the launch of the Handbook of the Irish Revival, edited by Declan Kybert and PJ Matthews, the idea of which came out of the first symposium and for the first time collected with, within one publication a lot of material that has been published over 100 years ago and that remained out of print. It is on sale in the, uh, in the foyer uh, and I'd recommend it. We, we, we've deliberately uh, priced it under 20 euros so that people would actually uh, could afford it. It is an extraordinary document which I think has a lot of contemporary resonances and it's a great legacy for us that it came out of the first symposium. Also on this stage, we had our rally for marriage equality with Irish artists at the centre of political activism and, uh, in this, on this stage in May. And finally, in October, we had the public meeting organised by Waking the Feminist Movement in response to the lack of gender balance in our Waking the Nation season. We will hear throughout the three days stories on how artists respond to political activism and new myth-making, whether it's Penny Arcade, Mark O'Halloran, Stacey Gregg or Fergus O'Crohor. On the subject of political demonstration, philosopher Judith Butler wrote, freedom does not come from me or from you. It can and does happen as a relation between us or indeed among us. The claim of equality is not only spoken or written, but is made precisely when bodies appear together. For Butler, protest and the change it demands does not occur in a physical space, but in the space that is created between voices and bodies when they act together. And you can relate that not only to theatre and to art, but to politics, and you will hear a lot of that discussion. Uh, you'll hear the extraordinary courage of Gideon Levy speaking uh, tomorrow around, uh, around the same issue, around the issue of, of, of the two sides and how one, both sides can actually engage with each other. With, with each other. Ima O'Toole will challenge the man problem for us in response to the Eighth Amendment. In fact, feminism is a recurring theme throughout the change, uh, Theatre of Change Symposium. We'll also look at how artists and activists approach the issue of cultural resistance in the occupied Golan. We'll hear Andrew O'Hagan examine artistic rights and challenges of privacy today. I mean, what are the ethics of storytelling? And we will continue to look to the Middle East not only with Gideon Levy's uh, talk, in light of what happened in Paris recently, of course, and the growing nihilistic depravity of ISIS. We will build on what we learned from Patrick Coburn last year when he, uh, and when we hear Lara Marlowe's talk uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon. Finally, before introducing our first artist, I want to thank the patron of the symposium, Professor Declan Kybert, our committee, fellow programmer Dominic Campbell, convener Kelly Phelan, and Administrator Jan, uh, Jan Snyder, and of course my own personal assistant Fiona Reynolds. Also, I want to thank my wonderful and talented colleagues in all departments of the Abbey Theatre who have made this and previous symposia work so well. So, considering the future and planning for change is necessarily uncertain. Time and again in developing this event, we resorted to anecdote and story as a way of communicating issues on the edge of tomorrow and the edge of our understanding. 
Therefore, we feel it most appropriate to offer two interlinked stories as a prelude to this symposium. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite and, uh, and for you to welcome actor, storyteller and broadcaster, Nuala Hayes. Thank you, Thea. Uh, Dear Eve, it's very nice to be here. A few short stories. Taster. There was once a young man who fell in love with the truth. He travelled the world searching for her. He climbed up to the top of mountains and deep into valleys, but she eluded him. Eventually, he caught up with her in a forest, in a clearing. She was old and stooped, with long grey hair and bosoms easing towards the earth. But her eyes were sharp and intelligent. He went to her and he asked her if he could spend some time with her. He, he pledged himself to her. He said he wanted to learn all she knew, all her wisdom, all about truth. And he said he'd help her in her work. He'd collect wood for her fire. He'd bring water from the well. He'd dig her garden. He'd plant her seeds. He'd harvest her crops. He just wanted to be with her. And so she agreed. And he stayed with her for quite some while. But one morning, maybe after a a bad dream. He woke up with a great longing to have a child. He wanted to become a father. So he went to her and he asked her, would she relieve him of his promise? Would she let him go? She thought for a while and then she said, yes, you can go, but on one condition, you must tell them that I am young and that I'm beautiful. The truth. Here's another one. <laughs> <laughs> this is from the Middle Eastern tradition. Truth and story were walking along the road. Truth was serious and intense. Story was open-faced, smiling, chatting and laughing with everyone. She wore loose, brightly coloured, comfortable clothes, sparkling rings, bracelets jangling. And when she came into a room, everybody wanted to talk to her. Everybody wanted to spend time with her. They invited her to their houses. They shared their stories with her. They just wanted to be in her presence. Truth was complaining. Nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody wants to hear what I have to say. Everybody wants to stay in their own comfortable little houses. Nobody wants to know the naked truth. Story looked at truth. And for the first time, she noticed she was half naked. Her clothes were ragged and torn. Her feet were filthy. Her hair was dank and plastered against her head. She has scars on her face and she shivered and itched and scratched at scars that wouldn't heal. And she said to her, come over here. Come in under my coat and I'll protect you. And she wrapped her large, voluminous cloak around the truth. And that's why, to this day, they say, wherever you have a story, you'll find the truth hidden under her cloak. <laughs> and there was a well below the sea, and the nine hazels of wisdom grew there, and their leaves and their blossoms broke in the same hour and fell in a shower that raised a purple wave. And the five salmon that were waiting there ate the nuts and their scales glowed brighter with their magic. And then they swam to the seven rivers of wisdom which sprung up from the well. Anyone who ate the flesh of that salmon would devour all the knowledge of the world. That was the story 
how it was told in a hundred firelit homes, the smuggling in of myth. And those words are the words of Lady Gregory, who was founder of this theatre. And as you know, she was a great collector of stories and folklore, as were the other two founders, John Singh and W.B. Yeats. Lady Gregory was very respectful of the stories. The other artists, they fashioned the stories to their own ends, to their own art. So I'd just like to finish up with another story, a, a different kind of story, but also on this theme of what is the truth? And this story was fashioned by a group of scientists, rational thinkers, and they were working on a, a serious project together over a long period of time, staying in the same place. And they decided, maybe in their downtime, to relax. They wondered whether they could create a folk tale that would serve their ends. And this is the story they created. There was once a man who was very, very successful. He had achieved everything in the world that he wanted. He was rich, he was prosperous, he had prestige, and he had power. Maybe in the Irish context, you might think, say, Dennis O'Brien, or who's that fellow who runs Ryanair? What's this, his name is? Michael O'Leary, of course, how could I forget? Anyway, that kind of man had it all, but he was not satisfied. He did not have the one thing, the truth. And so he decided he was getting on, he had achieved everything in his life, he decided he would sell everything. Oh, he looked after his family, of course, he gave them enough money so that they and their seven generations would never be poor. And so he set off traveling the world in search of the truth. And because he had influence and power, he met all the people of wisdom that he, he could be introduced to. He went to visit the Pope, he met the Dalai Lama, uh, people of power, maybe Obama, maybe Aung San Suu Kyi, people like that, maybe even Mary Robinson. But still, he felt he hadn't achieved what he was looking for. And now he was getting old, his money was all gone, and he was kind of disappointed. And then he met somebody who said to him, you're looking in the wrong place. See that mountain yonder, climb to the top of it. Nature, up there, you'll find what you're looking for. So he had nothing to lose, started climbing up the mountain. Remember, he's old and tired, struggles up to the top of the mountain. And <laughs> It took a while to get to the top. He saw another ridge and another, and then he saw a cave, and he was relieved he was there. And sure enough, on the top of the mountain, there was a young woman sitting in a yoga position, smiling beatifically. And when she heard him, she opened her eyes and asked him why he had come. He wasn't invited. And he told her, he said, I'm searching for the truth. I believe you can help me. She nodded in the way that people have the answer do. He waited. Please, he said, can you help me? This is my last hope. And then she said, in a high, vibrant voice, the truth is a flower. What, he said, the truth is a flower for fuck's sake. You, I, I've spent all my money, I have nothing left, and you tell me the truth is a flower. I'm sick of this. And he disappeared down the mountain, away, away. And from the distance, he heard her voice speak out in clearly as a bell. You mean, it's not a flower. Thank you.